So, what makes me cranky about Sonic the Hedgehog? That Paramount couldn't figure out how to get more product placement into this thing so they could afford to start over from scratch after everyone told them their trailer looked terrible. I mean, they were willing to have the characters stop and do a 30 second spot for Olive Garden in the middle of the movie, so why not hit up some other companies with deep pockets and get the cash to do it again the right way? By the time it was over, we should have had Sonic declare himself a member of the Pepsi generation, wolf down a family-sized bag of Doritos, and guzzle some Mountain Dew. Then maybe we would have been able to fix more than just the horrifying CGI werechild we saw in that first trailer. Don't get me wrong, the redesign of Sonic looks much better, and I absolutely applaud them having the humility to listen to the fans on that, but the unsettling Sonic design really was the fart spray on top of the garbage pile that trailer showed us. If we could just reshoot the movie with the people who handled the redesign in charge instead of the producer who thought giving a hedgehog human teeth and turning Robotnik into Ace Ventura were good ideas, it might even have been the first truly successful translation of a video game franchise to a film. So if we're gonna have Sonic sell out, let's have him sell out all the way and do it right. I'd certainly be willing to put up with a few more minutes of fourth wall breaking ads if it meant not having to suffer through Jim Carrey's obnoxious gyrating or the tedious fictional character makes it to our world plot. You don't even necessarily have to recast Jim Carrey, just have him tone it down a bit, make him more Truman Show and less Cable Guy. In fact, if we're gonna do all of these in-movie commercials in order to pay for the reshoots, you'd have a perfect opportunity for a throwback gag to Truman, where he asks, who the hell are you talking to, after Sonic gets done extolling the virtues of Olive Garden's never-ending postables. After all, there are at least a few moments where Carrey is still kind of funny. They're the rare ones where he acts like a person who might actually exist on Earth and be capable of functioning in a human society. The rest of the time, this guy who supposedly was born and raised here with the rest of us acts like an evil cartoon version of Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory doing his best Ace Ventura impression. I cannot possibly imagine this person surviving to adulthood no matter how smart they claim to be, and certainly not becoming someone the military would ever put in charge of anything. But hey, the military brass always has to be devoid of any kind of functional intelligence in movies, right? It happened so often you'd think it was written into the Constitution or something. I wonder if our werehog producer friend kept seeing the dailies and telling the director to get Carrie to ham it up some more, because otherwise the character might actually be tolerable. He still wouldn't be anything like any of the portrayals of Robotnik I could think of, but then again this movie has nothing to do with the franchise it's based on, so that's just par for the course. Like the scores of other movie adaptations that have no idea what to do with the source material, they just took an incredibly generic script and slapped the franchise labels on it. So stop me if you've seen this one before, but a cartoon character gets teleported into our world, meets a guy at a crossroads in his life, freaks that guy out, and drives him crazy by being really annoying, and then they become best buds when a villain forces them to run for their lives for about a half an hour. That's this movie, only this one stars Ryan Reynolds as Detective Pikachu. Or at least, I think that's what our producer buddy must have wanted, because that's how Sonic the Hedgehog is portrayed here. He's an ADHD quipster who for some reason produces a lot of electricity when he gets emotional, enough that he can ram himself into stuff and break it when he's charged up. The rest of the time he just bounces off and hurts himself. Even his quills contain some of this latent electrical energy, which I guess people from his world really want to steal for... reasons. That's basically the Detective Pikachu version of our little yellow Pokemon friend. Certainly not the blue blur with whom I've shared so many adventures in my youth. Now sure, Sonic may have been born as Mr. Needlemouse, but he isn't actually a little electric rat like Pikachu or constantly being chased by some goofballs that want to capture him. Sonic's just really fast, and he breaks things because he can spin his body as fast as he runs, so he deals damage through sheer kinetic energy. It used to be that the spinning basically turned his quills into a buzzsaw to straight up slice through stuff, but once he went 3D that was a little harder to make look believable, so now he, things just die from the impact. And Robotnik, aka Dr. Eggman, also isn't particularly interested in capturing Sonic or draining his powers or whatever. He's a simple, straight up, world domination kinda guy, and Sonic is just a giant pain in his ass. It's a vicious cycle of Eggman building some doomsday device and Sonic showing up and smashing it, usually with a little tussle over the Chaos Emerald somewhere in between. Considering they've even been forced to work together on a few occasions since the old days, at this point it's practically a friendly rivalry more than an uh, actual hero-villain thing. And while Sonic is really fast and does mock Robotnik constantly, he's not exactly a motormouth. He's certainly not needy or desperate for friendship. Sonic's shtick is having an attitude, exactly as you might expect from the company whose marketing slogan was Sega does what Nintendo don't. It's probably why they got Urkel to voice him in the animated adaptations from the 90s. 
Did I do that? Is way more likely to come out of Sonic's mouth than please, 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 please. We have to go stop and see that rubber ball. It'll be really, really cool. We gotta go. We gotta go. I guess that might make sense to somebody who knows nothing about him to assume that a character endowed with super speed would talk constantly and bounce from thing to thing like a kid on cocaine. But Sonic's speed actually frees him up to be incredibly lazy. After all, he can spend all day kicking back and eating chili dogs and still have more than enough time to ruin Robotnik's ear. He does things in his own time, at his own pace, when he feels like doing it. He doesn't need to ask permission, and he often prefers to go it alone so that nobody slows him down. That's part of that whole attitude thing. He's a teenager, not a toddler. In any case, I don't know if that's just how Ben Schwartz decided to play him, or if that's our little producer friend again. Though, I'd put my money on the latter. In fact, I assume pretty much everything I hate about this movie comes back to that producer guy, because they get so many fundamental things about the franchise wrong, and yet they handle the Sonic-related Easter eggs really well. You've seen a few in the trailers, like the hilltop sign being used as Sonic's ping-pong table, but there are a bunch of other obligatory references that come in just subtly enough so that you don't feel like somebody is waving it in your face. If you're a fan, you'll get it, but if not, you won't feel like the movie just stopped to point something out to you that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the rest of the film. Well, except, of course, the times that they need to remind you to go eat at Olive Garden, because, I mean, that paid for the redesign of Sonic and all that. But uh, anyway, you have to assume there was somebody who worked on this movie that owned a Sega back in the day, and that person was just constantly being overridden by some suit who actively hates video games. It's like how the movie starts out with some beautiful renditions of the classic music from the games, teases you with Sonic racing through an amazing rendering of Green Hill Zone, and then quickly sprints off to Earth for the on-the-nose pop music and the road trip hijinks with Cyclops, aka James Marsden, aka Tom, or... Donut Lord, as Sonikachu calls him. He's perfectly serviceable at looking at a tennis ball and being annoyed by it, if you care, since he isn't a Sonic character and is such a generic staple of this kind of movie, he's barely worth mentioning anyway. Hell, this movie is so unoriginal they have to rip off the Quicksilver time stop scene from the now defunct X-Men franchise. Which is doubly silly because as fast as Sonic is, I don't know if he's ever been shown to be that fast. You certainly don't get to be time stop fast in the games. Slow motion fast, sure, but not everybody else is frozen while I run around and do stuff to them fast. Fighting Robotnik wouldn't exactly be challenging if you could murder him eight times before he could blink. Plus, getting up to speed and controlling momentum are really key parts of the gameplay, and one of the main things that differentiates Sonic games from other platformers like Mario's. Making the character capable of instantly achieving relativistic velocities while in a confined space basically betrays everything fun about the games. Though I suppose it's really not fair to criticize the movie on that front since many of the actual games don't seem to grasp the difference between going real fast and generating and controlling momentum. So all that said, I guess the big question is where does it rank among the video game adaptations so far? Well, probably near the top just because it's watchable, decently paced, and largely coherent. It isn't a total disaster like the Mario movie was. It did make me chuckle a few times, and as I said, there are some Easter egg-style highlights. But on the other hand, it doesn't have any meaningful connection to Sonic the Hedgehog, and you could easily do a find and replace on the script for Sonic terms without anyone knowing the difference afterwards. As a kid's movie, I guess it works okay. It even has the mandatory fart joke, but I suspect even they have seen this movie a dozen times already. I knew all of this going in, of course, but I really did want to reward them for at least fixing the way Sonic looked. It's not perfect. But it's good enough, and in a world where fan complaints are usually met with accusations of sexism, racism, or the more general entitled man-baby who lives in his mother's basement-ism, it's a real breath of fresh air to have a company actually listen to the fans for once. So, despite this movie having virtually nothing to offer of note, I will still say go see a matinee, just to encourage more companies to replace the suits who know nothing with people who might actually like the source material. Vote with your wallet and all that. The best part of the movie is actually the mid credit sequel hook that follows the cool 16-bit credit sequence that reminds me a lot of what they did with the credits in Wreck-It Ralph, so feel free to stick around for that, and then afterwards you can book on out of there and not waste any more of your time on this paint-by-numbers flick. That's what I thought about Sonic the Hedgehog anyway. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, throw me a like if you enjoyed the video, and race on over to the subscribe button if you'd like to see more in the future. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time I have something to complain about.